My name is Danielle Benson. I run the Inspired Speaker Academy. And what I do is I help speakers like you, anyone who speaks as part of their job, as part of their life. So if it's in the boardroom, if it's online, if it's on stage for a TED Talk, I work with speakers to be more authentic and charismatic and confident in their speech. Because if you're not enjoying it, what's the point? <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So thank you all for being here today. I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourselves and I'm going to do it kind of the way that I can see you. Um, so I'm going to ask Wendy if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and introducing yourself to the group. Hello, everyone. It's so good to meet you. Uh, I've been working with Danielle for a while in speaking in particular, <laughs> um, and have watched her flourish with, with Grace. I know some of you are with Grace Lever. Uh, so I am um, a non-denominational minister who is focusing on helping parents right now to, um, to help build self-confidence, uh, self-resourcefulness and self-resilience in their age seven to 12 children to help them move into teenhood and adulthood in a more stronger, authentic uh, base. So I'm doing market research right now. I don't mean this to be a sales plug. This is what's coming to me to say. Um, and uh, I'm just really happy to be here. And it's always a learning experience, a good learning experience with Danielle. So thank you, everyone. Amazing. Thank you. I think your introduction is kind of the time where you tell people what you do. I think that's oh. com completely and absolutely uh, permissible. I think it's kind of part of the introduction. Uh, and Danielle, other Danielle, you're next on my screen. So would you mind introducing yourself? Um, hi, I'm Danielle Blumenberg. Um, I also know Danielle uh, through Grace um, and Doer's ambassadorship. Um, I am a conflict communication consultant. Um, I help people work through uh, conflict, improve their communication to hopefully improve their relationships along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. Very cool stuff. Thank you so much, Danielle. And this is your first open house, I believe. Yes, yes, it is. And I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. And Dion, you are next on my list. Thank you for being here. Do you mind introducing yourself? Hey, my name's Dion. Uh, as you said, Lo from Calgary. I'm in the uh, healthcare business and uh, unfortunately I have to give some talks every now and then. Uh, would love some guidance uh, with respect to that. Amazing. Thanks so much. Dion has been on a couple of other events, but this is your first open house, isn't it? That's correct, yes. Woo! Yay! Welcome. And Clara, you are next on my list. Would you mind introducing yourself? So hello, everyone. My name is Clara White. I am an economist and a political scientist. I'm also the executive director of Padea Mundi, which is a nonprofit organization that basically uh, focuses on creating an ethics of thought and action towards all human and living beings, this through the promotion of culture, arts and humanities. So what this means is we have two types of projects, a think tank program focused on ethics, public policy and leadership, and an educational program in which we work at conveying the results of our research of our think tank program. Um, at this point, we have activities such as um, cultural webinars, workshops, and we also have upcoming language sessions, including in Sanskrit, in Quechua, which is the most spoken um, indigenous language in the Americas, in Greek, in Latin, and in Irish Gaelic. So that's what we're doing. Thank you so much. That is so cool. I love how multicultural you are, Clara. It's just so exciting. <laughs> Tommy, you're next on my list. Would you mind introducing yourself? Certainly, Daniel. Uh, very lucky that I'm able to join. The, the, this, this is my first uh, open house workshop, and I'm looking forward to that. Unfortunately, I can't stay for very long. I can only stay until maybe 2 o'clock. Why I'm here, I'm here to improve my communication skill. I'm working as an IT consultant, IT professional, IT professional. 
and I've uh, been working really hard uh, with Daniel help to improve my communication skill. Amazing. Thanks so much, Tom. I didn't realize this was your first open house. I've seen your practice lab yeah. so much recently. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and then, Claudia, I'm thinking you don't want to introduce yourself because you turned your camera off. Is that a correct assumption? You can just type yes in the chat. I know uh, she just got her second vaccination shot, so she's going to be laying low. She's going to kind of watch and absorb all of our amazingness. <laughs> But Claudia, if you do want to chat at any time, you can always just throw something in the chat and I will do my best to keep my eye on the chat. So as a reminder to everybody, if you would like to speak, please type speaker in caps in the chat. And if you would like to ask a question, please write question in caps in the chat. I see we've already got one speaker lined up, so that's very exciting. Uh, I do want to say something before we get started about the importance of events like this and why I hold events like this. And the reason that the reason that I hold Practice Lab is because um, not Practice Lab, sorry, Open House, different events, ah, oh, very similar. The reason why I hold Open House is because it is so important for us to get practice, but to get mindful practice. And I think a lot of us experience. Uh, nerves. I think a lot of us experience uh, stage fright. And the thing is, is that when you, when you have stage fright, a lot of the advice is just to do it over and over again. You know, we all know of this exposure therapy, the more you do it, the less scary it will be. And that's true. It will become less scary, but you get good at what you practice. So if you're just practicing over and over and over again, and you're practice speaking badly, and you continue to practice speaking badly, you're going to get really good at speaking badly. <laughs> And that's not what I want for you. I want you to improve with practice, not only for you to lose your nerves, but also to get better. And so the point of things like Open House and also like Practice Lab, which is a similar event, but for members, the point of this is to have a place where you can practice safely, where, um, I mean, this is in public, so there is that, but, um, you know, it's there's no expectation of performance um, I'm certainly not judging you. There is an expectation of this is a workshop setting. I am here to give feedback. We're all here to learn together. And so you're getting the practice, you're getting the exposure therapy, but you're also getting one or two tips on how to improve along the way. And I think that is extremely important because it's not just about doing it over and over again to get rid of the nerves. It's also about you know, mastery will give you confidence as well. It's not only exposure therapy that will give you confidence, but also learning how to do something better. The process of learning is usually what gives us confidence as well. And so that is why I hold these events, because I think it's very important to have a place to practice, because so few of us do. You know, it's, it's either alone in your apartment to your plants, or even your, your fake plants, uh, <laughs> or it's on the day you know, this very scary, high pressure, you're in front of hundreds of people potentially, and that's it. Those are your only two options. So I like to give something in between. Uh, and I did want to answer the question that yes, absolutely, you do not have to have something prepared for open house. You can just make it up as you go along, or you can ask me to interview you, which I'm quite happy to do. So those are two different things. You can choose to speak for five minutes extemporaneously, spontaneously off the cuff, or you can ask me to interview you and I'm quite happy to do that as well. And so our first speaker is Wendy. And Wendy, what would you like to do? Well, it doesn't actually have a title, my dear, but um, I'd like to see how it goes, how it flows. So let me share with you an okay. experience that I had this morning. Are you timing me Before now? you start, before oh, yeah. you start, oh. <laughs> uh, something very important that I like to ask everyone is what are you focusing on what is your focus what would you like feedback on because if we if we just kind of have this blank slate of feedback we're going to just say the easiest things that it is to see and that's not necessarily the most helpful thing to the person who's speaking so we want to give them feedback that is actually in alignment with their goals with what they're working on so what are you working on what is your highest value for this what would you like feedback on I think for today, the highest value is just being able to speak off the cuff. As you know, I've been well prepared and, and over prepared in much of my speaking experience, which has helped me. Yeah. But um, I just would really like to just speak and see if people feel me I, and, and if they get something from it. I, that's, that's where I'm at. And 
I forgot everyone was going to be uh, giving feedback. But well, we no, go. not everyone. Not everyone's going to be giving oh. it on the call. Oh, but I'm, okay. I'm going to ask people to type it if they have something positive to say. Okay. So does it um, does it need to be full five minutes? No. It could, no. Okay. No, no, no. That's just your maximum. Okay. So I will stop you at five minutes. So your focus. So everyone who's watching um, on the replay and also live here today in the call, mm -hmm. uh, Wendy's focus is just to be able to speak in a way that feels authentic, that mm -hmm. feels real, and she wants to know if you understand what she's she's saying. So mm -hmm. if you feel like you can give her some constructive feedback in the chat, please uh, only positive feedback when you don't know somebody because we are all strangers and we want to keep this safe. So positive feedback only. Um, I will give constructive feedback, but for the strangers in the room, it's just nice. It's nice to know that you're going to get positive feedback. So positive feedback only. Yeah. And um, so that's what Wendy is focusing on. That's what she wants feedback on. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's get you set up. Let's get rid of my pen so that you are taking the stage and whenever you're ready, my dear. Okay, thank you so much, Danielle. Again, my name is Wendy Yaboski and it is so exciting to be here and to share this, uh, this idea with you that I had this morning in my morning pages. So for those of you who don't know what morning pages is, it's something that was uh, put out by author Julia Cameron. And it's where every morning, first thing, you just write and write and write for three pages, eight and a half by 11. And it's the most amazing experience. So this morning, what came up for me toward the end was how much I appreciate actually you, Danielle Benson, um, for being able to create uh, something new. You know how sometimes we always try to be like other people or do what I, I speak for myself, <laughs> to do what other people are doing and do it well? Well, there are some people, and Danielle is one of them, who create something of her own somehow. And the one thing I'm talking about, if you're not familiar with it, is video journaling. That has been one of the things, not the only, but one of the things that has spoke to me so loudly and I'm so appreciative of where we practice video by being authentic, by speaking what's on our heart, what, whatever that is, happy, sad, mad, glad, whatever it is. And so I thought to myself, wow, you know, I'm so grateful for Danielle having the, um, the wherewithal and the courage to say to her people, <laughs> um, here's an idea try this and see what happens. I've tried it and survived, <laughs> but, um, but try it and see. And it's helped me have so much more video confidence than ever before. And just going back to Julia Cameron, um, the author who's a prolific author, she's amazing. And the morning pages, I'm thinking I have experienced so much personal growth in doing these morning pages. I thought, thank you, Julia Cameron, for bringing this out to the world um, in her book, The Artist's Way, if you don't already know, um, and helping people she will never meet. She's never going to meet me. And I'm so grateful for her. So I asked myself, what is it that maybe I can do in my life how can I believe that I too have something in me that maybe I've done already and haven't acknowledged that other people would benefit from? Because I do believe that we all come here as unique beings with our own gifts, whether those are gifts of what we're doing, who we're being, um, how we do what we do. I just don't believe we're not here for a reason. And so one of the things that I really appreciate to do is to be able to help people, even as I'm trying to do this, and I'm doing this myself to help people believe in the possibilities within them. What if we each had something absolutely grand to offer? And maybe in that moment, we don't think it's so grand. It's just what we're used to, right? <laughs> um, but the willingness to share it with others and see what happens. I've heard it said so often in so many ways that um, sometimes we fall, not fall, we stop just short of the success that we really desire. 
And I think that that is the same with what we think we have to offer, not just what we want to achieve. And I don't know, personally, I can't think of anything more fulfilling than um, feeling like I'm here for contribution. Yes, I want to enjoy my life. And it's fulfilling to contribute to others when I can. So I just really support each of you to maybe along with me, just explore, <laughs> explore for the next month or two or three. Like, you know, what is it that I do that might be helpful to someone else? Is it something I can put into a talk? Is it something that I can write in a blog? Is it what is it? Because who knows what difference we can make to others. And I trust that because each of us is here, that matters in our own way. So again, thank you so much. It's wonderful to meet you. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. And um, I'll hear you later. Bye-bye. I'll hear you later. That's adorable. <laughs> um, what am I going to do here? This is me learning. Oh, I like the new um, the new Zoom options. I'm I'm into them. I don't actually know if it's new Zoom options or if it's just that I have a new computer. <laughs> One way or the other. There's and there's your five minutes, uh, Wendy. Well done. So uh, I'm would like to invite everyone who is on the call or even on the replay in the Facebook, uh, if you have any positive things to say to Wendy about how she came across, uh, if she connected to you, if you understood what she was saying, please do type those in the chat. Feedback is amazingly useful to everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. And Wendy, how did that feel? It felt really good. Like, I, I just want to say, Danielle, try not to take up too much time here. <laughs> but just to say, one of the things I learned from video journaling is that before I pressed record, uh -huh. I'm thinking, I got nothing. But I started... And it was amazing what started to come. And that's how yeah. this felt. So I feel blessed. I feel excited that maybe I touched someone's heart or mind. Um, and that um, when I thought I had nothing to say, like I told you, maybe mm. extemporaneous, um, I do have something to say. That is such a good point. And actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause the feedback to speak to that because um, I want to just say that that is so true. And that's something that I think a lot of us don't believe because often our nerves will stop us from connecting to what we have to say. And so we'll press record or, you know, we'll stand up on stage and we'll freeze. And we think that we have nothing to say. We think that nothing is coming, but it's just that the nerves are blocking us. And the truth is, is that you always have something to say. If you are relaxed, if you are comfortable, enough from video journaling or whatever it is you're doing, there will always be something. And the only time that something doesn't come when you freeze, when you lose it and you're, you just go blank, that's not because you have nothing to say. That's because there are nerves that are blocking you. Something's happening. You, you're, you're into fight or flight or, you know, it's something else. It is not a lack of content. It is not a lack of insight. We all live very rich lives, even even me who barely leaves my apartment, you know, <laughs> I have, I have interesting thoughts every day and I read interesting books and, you know, we all have lots to say. It's just that in the moment, sometimes we shut down, but it's not a lack. I just wanted to say that because I think sometimes we experience that and we think it's because we have nothing to say. And that is not, that is not the case. So, um, so you, you found your flow. That's great. I'm so glad. And I feel the same. I thought it was very well, actually, I thought it was quite well structured as well, uh, given that it was completely spontaneous. You started with the very personal and then you brought it out to, to a call to action to us all. And that is a lovely format in any sort of kind of thought provoking, especially in kind of like social media sharing kind of thing when you're like, oh, this happened to me. And, and then you kind of draw people into your personal story because you're vulnerable and you're sharing. And then you flip it and say, so how about you? How can we bring this into the world? And that is a wonderful uh, format to follow. So um, I have some technical notes, but I'm actually going to give them later as just kind of general advice because I think everyone needs them. Um, and that's also not what you were focusing on. So <laughs> I do, uh, your eye contact got better as you went along. At the beginning, you were looking down a lot as you were thinking, as you were searching for what to say. But as you got more comfortable, as you got more in flow, you started looking at the camera more. And so that's something to be aware of when you start out is how can you how can you start out with that relationship with us 
bring us into it, bring us to be part of it sooner. Because I felt very included at the end, but I didn't feel included at the beginning. I felt with you. You were you were very passionate. You were very you know connected to what you were saying, but I didn't feel included in the same way as when we have eye contact. Um, yeah, and your your passion really came through. The only um, point that I would suggest for improvement, and this is this is kind of a bigger thing. And, and Wendy and I work together, as she mentioned, so I I probably wouldn't suggest this to someone who was brand new. <laughs> but we've worked together before, and I know you're going to come back to practice lab, so we'll work on this together. Is uh, you're sitting on top of your voice, even in extemporaneous speaking. And it's probably a habit that you've built from memorizing. Because typically when we memorize, we, we tend to be on top of our voice and we tend to kind of string all the thoughts together because, because of the way we learn words. And so you've brought that habit into your extemporaneous speech because it's something that you're used to. So the next step, once you get comfortable with speaking off the cuff, because I know that that is very difficult for you, once you're comfortable doing that, then the next step is to let yourself be in the moment a little bit more with your breath. And because you've got this big engine of your passion, uh, you don't need to be speaking all the time. You can allow yourself to breathe in. You can give yourself space to think. And that will also allow you to connect to your deeper voice. And I don't mean deeper as in pitch. I don't mean like deeper voice. I mean like more connected, more true voice. Because right now, everything that you're saying, you're, you've kind of got that control thing going on because you want to make sure that we listen to you and you want to make sure that you say everything that you want to say. And it's all very controlled and it's beautiful. And what you say is lovely, but it's not that really deep connection that juicy connection that we strive for and that is not an easy thing to get this is going to be a process um, but that's really the only thing i would say because it was very well structured you were very passionate about what you were saying i understood your thoughts very clearly so that would be the next step is to relax into yourself and to relax into your breath and allow yourself to connect even more with your voice as you speak does that make sense Total sense. Thank you so much for everything, Daniel. I appreciate it's it. It's a pleasure. Any final questions, Wendy? No. Okay, cool. You have a whole minute left in your feedback, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we don't have to use it. Um, and thank you, everyone, for putting your comments uh, in the chat. Wendy, I hope you read those to yourself. Um, yeah, so uh, remember, anyone who wants to speak, please type speaker in the chat. And anyone who has a question, please type question in the chat. Uh, Tom, I know you're not going to be here for very long. So if you want to speak, now might be the time. Um, while you're deciding whether or not you want to, I'm going to address those technical concerns. So if you're wearing a headset like I am, this isn't nearly as much of a concern. But if you are using your computer microphone or a, a tabletop microphone, like a, a Yeti or a snow snowball, blue snow, whatever, whatever they're called, one of these. If you're ah, if you're using one of these, it's called blue. I don't know. Um, if you're using one of those, you need to be very careful about your ambient sound because the microphone is not next to your mouth. It is actually a lot closer to your hands, and so anything that your hands do is going to be amplified more than your voice. So anytime you touch your computer, anytime you touch your desk, if you're fiddling with a pen, anything like that is going to be heard louder than your voice because it's actually closer to the microphone. So that is something to be aware of. If you are using a microphone that isn't right next to your face, don't touch anything. <laughs> just, just don't touch. Just be in like a vacuum if you can while you're speaking. And then the other thing is um, best practice for framing. So I am so stoked. I have a new computer now. Finally, I've been without a properly functional computer for almost a month. It was, it was horrible, but I now have a beautiful new iMac and it's a little bit high. It's, I usually like my lens to be about there and it's, it's up a little bit because it's so big. But uh, ideally we want our eye line, our, our lens to be just above our eye line. And then as far as framing goes, this is actually quite nice. Finally, I have a big enough uh, lens for a good frame to have my elbows in shot. Now, this isn't always possible. Most of us, um, we get cut off about here, but we don't want to get cut off too high. So if we can get cut off kind of mid breastbone, what's that like third button, second button, third button? <laughs> 
if we can get cut off like mid breastbone, it's like a bust. If you imagine those those old statues, you know, a bust statue, that's kind of the cut that we want. We want enough of our shoulder in the shot so that we don't look like we're a floating head. So when we are designing our frame, you want to make sure that you have enough of your shoulders in the frame to be seen. Ideally, in a perfect world, we can see your elbows. Because if we can see your elbows, we can see your hands, and you can stop gesturing, and you can start gesturing, and it's not this weird, because if you can't see my elbows, it, it turns into this, uh, which happens. Sometimes we can't avoid it. And then, um, what was the other thing? Uh, oh, and then, uh, Wendy, like me, you are a glasses wearer. I'm also a glasses wearer, but I put my contact lenses in for stuff like this because I just don't want to deal with glasses glare. And that's always an issue. So if you have your light right in front of you, you're much more likely to experience glasses glare. But if you have a light on either side, and actually my light is on the side of me and I have a, a window here, as you can see, is my garden. Um, I have light coming in from both sides. So even if I was wearing my glasses, the problem is, is that your computer screen can act as a light. So you need to have dark things. If you have white on your computer screen, it might glare on your glasses, even if your lights are on either side. Uh, so you want to have like dim your computer screen or something so that it's not reflecting against your glasses because that stops us from making eye contact. It's impossible to make eye contact. Even if you're looking at the lens, I can't see your eyes because they're all glared. So that was, uh, that was my technical... Those are my technical tips for being on Zoom, particularly uh, on camera calls. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is anyone who speaks today, if you would like a separate version, a separate video of your speaking, please do let me know and I will cut that out because I put the whole replay up, but it's going to be like an hour. So if you don't want, if you don't want to edit out your own speaking bit <laughs> and you would like to use this whatever you use using whatever you're speaking about today if you would like to use this in your social media or share it on your facebook group but you only want your piece please just let me know and i will send it to you um, i'm quite happy to do that uh all right so tom decided not to speak yet to run so does anyone else want to speak or shall i keep talking i can interview you i can go ahead if yeah you want. The brave Clara White. Fantastic. Let's just um, give you a pin here. So Clara, before we get started, what is your focus? What would you like to focus on today? Or are you being interviewed or are you speaking extemporaneously? First question. Let's go for an interview. Interview. Okay. And yes. what would you like to focus on in your interview? Um, I suppose I need to focus on the breathing and for the audience members who are watching you what kind of feedback do you want from them what do you want to know from them like do you want to know if I you come across as whether what, you're talking about? what i potentially said was clear okay <laughs> so do they understand you is what you're saying clear are they yeah. are they picking up what you're putting down yes exactly <laughs> amazing super so this is a valid option for anyone who wants to speak extemporaneously but doesn't you know necessarily know what they want to say I'm very happy to interview you and then it's then you could actually what we'll do is well i'll keep the side to side and if you want to use this as for for example in social media or on your youtube channel or whatever you're welcome to just take this little piece and uh share it as a legit interview uh, why not so welcome. Today I have Clara White with me on the call. And Clara, I know your organization is called Padea Mundi. Can you explain what this organization is and why it has such an unusual name? Yes. So Padea Mundi is a nonprofit organization. We focus on creating an ethics of thought and action in favor of all human and living beings on this planet this through the promotion of culture, arts, and humanities. So this is why we have such a weird name, Padea Mundi. It comes from ancient Greek and Latin. Padea was the high culture or the culture that the ancient Greek wanted to transmit to the children so they could become 
good citizens and take over the city and, and public policies of the city in the right way. And mundi means of the world in Latin. So it would, if we would translate it, it would basically come out as culture of the world, which is exactly what we're doing because we are relying on the various philosophical traditions of different people, like Western philosophy, obviously, but also um, Chinese philosophy, indigenous philosophy, etc., in order to um, create this ethics I was talking about previously. So this is where our name comes from and how it is linked to our mission. So there are three big words in there. One of them is culture. One of them is ethics and one of them is philosophy. So I think for the, the average person, we may not realize how those are connected. So can you explain to us what the connection is between those three and why it's important to, to work on them together? Yeah, so actually um, <clears throat> the mandate came out from, a, from noticing that science and technologies have improved very rapidly over the past hundreds of years, hundreds of years, a few centuries. And that we now have enhanced tools that we didn't have before and that give us huge power. And this power can be used the right way or the wrong way. So the idea of Padiamundi is that we need to rebuild our ethical models, our worldview, and this using the tools of political philosophy. And political philosophy has a very ancient history in West. I saw this thing on Facebook that uh, I'm sure everyone's seen it. You know, Zoom calls are kind of like a seance. Are you there? Can you hear us? We can't, we can't hear you. Are you there? <laughs> I just love that. I think it's hilarious. Um, you know, it's just so true. <laughs> The modern day seance. All right, Clara is back. Clara, are you with us? Can we see you? Can we hear you? Oh, I don't know what's going on. Hey. Yes, okay. excuse me. I've changed my connection. I've moved ah. to another place. So perfect. Yes. So. I was saying um, we can use political philosophy, and political philosophy has a very ancient history. Like in Western culture, you can think about Plato. Aristotle, etc. In Chinese culture, you could think about Confucius, about Mengzi, about Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism, etc. So in various human traditions, you have very ancient political philosophies and political philosophical tools that we can use. And so that's what we're trying to do, to build this new worldview and this new ethics in favor of all human and living beings on this planet, relying on those various political philosophical traditions. That's Amazing. Thank you. And we actually have a question from the panel. Uh, how do you propose world ethics can be changed? And I think this is kind of part of what you want to do, right? So it's a very uh, big question. Our worldview, you mean? Um, uh, well, it's not my our, question. Our, it's, it's, it would be a long story, but uh, basically our worldview has entered into a crisis um, this is not the first time in humankind's history that we go through a worldview crisis. Um, at the time of Confucius and Plato and Aristotle, they live basically around the same time. The humankind was also going through a, a major uh, worldview crisis and previous values <clears throat> and myths, etc., were no longer uh, relevant to the people. So um, new philosophies emerged in different civilizations at the same time, like in China, just mentioned, in India, in Persia, in ancient Greece, etc. And um, German philosopher Karl Jasper has called this time the actual age, because it was an age of major shift in human thought with um, new values such as relying on reasons to analyze the world, <clears throat> such as humanism, so that centering our vision on human beings and the needs of, of people. Um, and I think because of those huge changes in science and technologies that we've been going through, we are now facing a new worldview crisis where our previous myths, our previous values are not, no longer completely relevant to the new challenges that we're facing. 
And so we're going through a new actual age, which is going to imply other paradigmatic shift. And that's what we're working on at Bade Amundi, trying to figure out what those shifts are going to be and how we can rebuild our worldview and the scale of values it is based on. That's a big, big thing. That's a big uh, ambitious goal. Uh, how, um, how, are, how are you planning to make this, this, this very large idea and this big change accessible to people? Like, what are your, what are your ways of reaching people? Okay, so we have, on the one hand, we have the Think Tank program, which is a research program, and we have several people who are involved, people specializing in philosophy, people specializing in literature, potentially people specializing in science and technologies, etc. <clears throat> and uh, we also have, on the other hand, this educational program that I talked about, which is in development, but it is going to offer, it is already offering cultural work, um, webinars, workshops, um, language classes, etc. But we intend to, sorry. Tech, please hold for technical difficulties. And then you're muted again, Clara. Um, right, you're muted, you're muted still, Clara. You were telling us about the, the webinars, the programs? Yes, I don't know why I'm having so many issues. So <laughs> anyways, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we, have, we already have cultural webinars and et cetera, but we are slowly developing an educational program which will help us uh, convey people who are not specializing in political philosophy, the foundations so that they have the tools to um, develop their own reflection and, and potentially improve their own way of acting in the world if they are interested in doing so. So that would be more um, educational programs dedicated to people in positions of leadership, be they business leadership, political leadership, etc. Amazing. And last question, just because I missed it in the chat, uh, I do apologize. Uh, we also have another question. What is your definition of ethics? My definition of ethics <clears throat> is um, <clears throat> ethics would be some sort of a science of, of, of values and a, a developing a knowledge on values, what is good and what is bad, um, creating a scale with those values. That, that's the work of ethics more generally, you know, thinking the values and how they can be arranged on a scale, what is good, what is bad, what is fair, what is unfair, etc. That's That's the work of ethics very rapidly. Amazing. Thank you so much, Clara. So uh, I do invite everyone who is on the call and also anyone who is on face on the Facebook Live, any positive feedback that you have for Clara, specifically around her clarity, whether or not you could understand her. We had all sorts of technical issues around that. So please don't say like I couldn't understand you because your internet. Anyway, that's also not positive. So you're not allowed to say that anyway. Uh, but yes, anything positive that you have to say around her thought structure, around her ideas, around the way that she was speaking, and whether or not she was under like whether or not you understood uh, what she was talking about, really. Uh, Clara, how did that feel? Good, except for the technical issues. <laughs> you handled them very well. You were just kind of back on as quickly as possible. So uh, you didn't let yourself get very flustered by that, which is a skill in itself, I think. It's very easy to let ourselves get thrown by technical issues. So well done for coming back and just getting straight back into it, remembering where you were, uh, and kind of jumping on that. Uh, as far as feedback goes, I have said this before to Clara, but I'll say it again. I love the way you use your hands, the way that you speak with your hands. When we orient our words in space by using gestures, even if it's not, you know, she's not using literal gestures, but just by saying, you know, this and then this, and, you know, she, she's kind of describing things with her hands. It's amazing how useful that is in helping us understand what you're saying and helping us to parse, kind of break apart your grammar as well. There's 
there's magic in gestures. The first thing is that it brings your voice to life. So when you're using gestures, it engages the body. So instead of me being a talking head and just kind of talking, as soon as I'm using my hands, my vocal energy will become more alive. My vocal energy will become more varied, more interesting, more rich, because I'm using my whole body. So that's the first thing the gestures do. And then the second thing is that it allows us to separate our ideas. So ideally, you are separating your ideas with breath, but also using your hands to separate ideas allows your audience to <clears throat> kind of connect with your ideas differently. Um, I just did a, a Facebook Live about using space and storytelling, and it's kind of the same idea, is that you have an idea over here and you have an idea over here. Now, immediately, my audience has almost a visual guide as well. Not only is my vocal variety changed by the fact that I'm using gestures, but my audience has a spatial relationship with the ideas that I'm sharing. And, that, and we are spatial creatures. We are very, um, we think very much in space, <laughs> in space. We think spatially. And so uh, allowing your audience to take something very intangible, like an idea, like, like something like ethics, for example, and to give them something physical to grab onto just because it's oriented in space with your gestures is it's amazingly useful. So well done on that. I love the way you use your gestures, Clara. You are extremely good at that. As far as one thing to improve goes, and again, this isn't going to be news to you because this is something that we are working on in Practice Lab. Uh, when you get a little bit nervous or a little bit excited, and I can understand with all the tech, I'm amazed you weren't uh, more throne, uh, you tend to speak a little bit from your throat. And when we speak from our throat, there's a certain tone that comes in that is the tone of tension. We can hear the tension in the throat when we're speaking from the throat, um, as opposed to when I'm speaking from my body, when my voice is more relaxed, it also becomes more pleasant. And so we, we naturally, as audience members, as anyone who's listening to someone, we have a dislike for the sound of tension because tension means danger. Like if we were out in the wild, we'd be tense because we're running from a tiger or whatever. <laughs> tension is not healthy and it's, it's, it often means danger. And so we have learned to dislike that sound, whereas we love the sound of relaxation because it means safety. And so there's a psychological element to this, a very strong psychological element to this, that we like the sound of a relaxed voice because it make, makes us feel safe. It, it implies intimacy. There's a lot of other things going on there. And so when we're a little bit nervous and we let our nerves take us up into our throat, uh, that tone of tension can be there. And again, this is, this is not a big deal. Uh, Clara, you're already a very good speaker. Uh, partially, I think, because of the experience that we've had together. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's, it's very, very subtle, but it's the only thing that I would improve. So I'm going to say it. Uh, the only thing that I would improve is to let, you know, move even further into relaxing into the voice and, and kind of also the same as Wendy, connecting to the breath a little more, which is difficult to do when you're excited and difficult to do when we're nervous. Uh, but that would be my, that would be my only point of improvement for you. Do you have any questions, Clara? Um, no, not for now. Thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you. Really great job. And I, I love hearing about what you do. It's, it's very inspiring to me. I love these big ideas. Um, and thank you everyone for your feedback in the chat. I encourage you to continue. Uh, if anyone hasn't written feedback, I'm, I'm not going to read through all of it, but Clara, please do take a look at the feedback, your feedback in the chat. All right. So does anyone else want to talk? Or we're feeling a little bit nervous still. Would you like Danielle to talk? Does anyone have any questions actually um, about anything that's come up? So if you don't want to speak, maybe you have a question about a good speaking habit or some best practices, something uh, that you would like to know about from me, just so that I'm not just talking about things that I care about. I want to be talking about things that you care about if we're going to be chit-chatting. I want to be chit-chatting about stuff that you like. So um, please do just write uh, in the chat if there's anything that you are curious about or anything you wanted to comment on that you've learned so far. Um, I'm getting very distracted. There are some really cute little birds, some chickadees on my balcony. They've come to visit and they're just so adorable. Uh, this is my therapy. I have a, a 
window next to my office and I um, have these little chickadees come visit. They're just so cute. Uh, so come on, folks. Any questions? If you don't have any questions, I'm going to have to make something up and it might not be something of interest to you. Question. Should one try to lower your voice? Oh, that is such a good question. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> the answer is always complicated. Well, it depends. No, you shouldn't try to lower your voice. Because if we try to lower our voices, it tends to come across as inauthentic and possibly quite comical. And also, it's going to do damage if we're, if we're doing it in a way that is forced. So if we're consciously lowering our voice, then that is bad. However, tapping into a more relaxed voice is going to naturally lower your pitch. So as I was saying earlier, which is why this question came up, I imagine, is the sound of tension tends to raise our pitch. So as soon as I'm tense, my voice goes up in pitch. And most of us, our normal walking around everyday voices aren't actually our true voices. There are voices up a little bit because we have residual tension in our lives. We get cut off in traffic. We're stressed about work. We're stressed about this. What am I going to have for dinner tonight? You know, all those little tensions come into our lives and they are, they do affect our voice. And so your habitual voice, and I really make the distinction between your natural voice and your habitual voice, your habitual voice, the one you use every day, probably has a reasonable amount of tension in it. Potentially, I don't know, everyone's different. But chances are that a lot of people tend to speak a little bit more from the throat. They tend to be a little bit more tense in the way that they're speaking just because of the lives that we live. And so a great way to make someone feel welcome or to make someone feel safe is to allow your voice to relax, not to force it into a lower tone but to breathe deeper so the deeper the breath goes the more relaxed the voice will be if i'm breathing very shallowly my voice will be tense whereas if i'm breathing deeper into my body i mean ideally all the way into my bum if i can but if you can't breathe into your bum at least into your belly at least at least into your belly then the voice gets more relaxed and the tension leaks out of the throat, it moves out of the throat into other part of the body, it starts to dissipate, and your voice will naturally become lower. So you're not consciously making the voice lower, you're consciously relaxing your voice body instrument, you're letting the breath go deeper, and allowing yourself to maybe luxuriate in your voice a little bit, because speaking should feel good. Speaking should be a physical, physically pleasant sensation. It really should be. It's got, you've got vibrations moving through your body. Speaking should feel good. And if your speaking doesn't feel good, there's probably a little bit of tension in your voice. So yeah, to make someone feel more uh, safe or welcome, we can very consciously relax ourselves, sit back into the voice a little bit more, enjoy it a little bit more. It will naturally lower in pitch, probably, most likely. It's always a generalization but probably it will become lower in pitch just through that relaxation. And that is very pleasant to listen to. But a forced, like a tense low pitch is just as unpleasant to listen to as a tense high pitch. So it's the, the sound of tension we dislike, not actually the pitch itself. If we have a higher voice and it is open and relaxed, it's actually quite nice to listen to. It's, it's, the, it's the amount of tension. I hope, did that answer your question? Give me a nod. Or yes, thumbs up, even better. Did you have a follow-up, Dion? Did you want to unmute yourself and have a follow-up question or comment? Yes, um, I do uh, have a follow-up. Um, by the way, this isn't a fake deep voice. <laughs> it doesn't sound fake. <laughs> um, if, uh, if we were standing uh, during a Zoom call, and I'm suspicious I've seen a couple of guys doing that just through their sort of body movements, would that allow deeper breathing. Mm, absolutely. So the idea, I mean, again, it depends on your posture. Mm -hmm. Because if you lock your knees and your pelvis when you stand, it isn't always better. But most of the time, most speaking coaches will say stand because it's easier for you to access your breath. It's easier for you to access your breath capacity. Um, and it's easier for your voice to be alive. 
it's not always the case because some people feel so uncomfortable standing that their whole body tenses up. And so it's not always true. But in a very general case, people tend to be more open. They tend to be more fluid and more relaxed when they are standing. It is important to relax the pelvis and release the knees. Most of us stand with our knees locked. And when your knees are locked, it does inhi inhibit the movement of the diaphragm. And so you're not going to be able to have a full breath if your knees are locked, and especially if your pelvis is locked. So it does depend on your posture. Some people, most people, the reason most people uh, can't speak properly when they're sitting down is because they collapse. So most people, as soon as they sit down, they get the kind of computer posture, their shoulders come forward, and their, their back kind of humps a little bit. And that means that they can't access their breath either and they actually cut themselves off much higher and so that is why most people say don't sit when you're speaking because most of us collapse when we're sit when we're sitting sitting seated however if you sit up really straight and you've got a if you have a better posture sitting than you do standing it's actually better to sit when you speak if you can keep in mind that you need to be energized and awake and kind of full in your body it can be better to sit you want both of your feet to be on the floor underneath your knees uh your again the position of the pelvis is so important it mustn't be kind of tucked out you've got to have a very ergonomic way of sitting but it is completely possible if you're sitting up straight to be very energized when you're seated as well. So it's it's more about the posture than it is about whether or not you're standing or sitting. Most people find it easier to have a more open aligned posture when they're standing. And that is why. And also you, it kind of takes a bit more energy to stand. And so they're more energized <laughs> when they're standing. Does that make sense, Dion? That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. And I did want to actually say, uh, you don't have a, a forced lower voice at all. <clears throat> Excuse me, your voice is very relaxed, beautifully relaxed. Uh, the, the flip side to that is that we need strength as well in our voice. So uh, your voice is extremely pleasant because it is extremely relaxed, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean it has a lot of power in it. And so that is uh, pleasantness and power are completely different things. Um, so pleasantness is about people enjoying listening to you and you have this beautiful lovely relaxed voice and power is about can you hear me at the back of the room that kind of thing so i just wanted to make sure that i hadn't conflated those two anything else uh, no uh, i need to try and navigate that uh, epic voice uh, you know so that i'm not too soporific and uh, yeah any uh, suggestions would be great Oh, I have a whole workshop on power. Um, the my most my most useful uh, exercise for this is um, so, Dion. You're a member a member of the speakers training portal, so we're going to rec recommend an exercise. Actually, I think the exercise is online, so I'll be able to share it with everyone. Uh, this particular exercise, I call it the fricative breath, and you use it using your floating ribs. And the reason it's so useful for power is that it really makes you use a lot of your capacity, your breath capacity. And so the power of our voice is dictated by how much air pressure is moving through the vocal folds, how much pressure there is in the air moving through the vocal folds. So um, if I don't have a, if I'm not using my full capacity, then my voice might be less powerful. It might not be carrying as far. But the more of my breath capacity that I use, the more muscular my breath is, the more powerful my voice is. I, I don't want my voice to be muscular. I want the breath to be muscular. And so using the floating ribs or the spare ribs, as some people call them, <laughs> uh, is a great way for that because they are so they're so mobile. So our fixed ribs, which are the ribs that are att attached at the sternum and the spine, they don't they can't move very much they're very strong but they can't move very much and then we have the floating ribs which were attached at the bottom of the spine um not at the bottom of the spine but at the bottom of the rib case but they're not attached at the sternum and so they can open they have much more freedom of movement but they still have the strength of the intercostal muscles and talking to a medical professional i hope i'm using all the right uh <laughs> terminology um but yeah, so, so the, the, they still have that strong muscular strength, but they also have the mobility. Whereas when we're breathing into the belly and into the pelvis, there is so much space there 
but it's not necessarily strong. And so if we if we want the voice to be powerful, we need both capacity and strength. And that's why the floating ribs are are so magical because they have both. Whereas um, the fixed ribs are very strong, but not a lot of capacity. And the belly and the pelvis have a lot of capacity, but they're not very strong. And so that's why the floating ribs are so magic. And um, I have an exercise that I did not make up. I learned it. I don't remember where I learned it because I was so young and I've been using it for so long, but I, I call it the fricative breath. And it's just a, just a way of breathing in and out in a controlled way that allows you to really isolate the floating ribs as much as possible so that you can build that muscle. And then when we're speaking to speak from there. So if I am breathing, it's not enough just to have your floating ribs. You have to use them. Uh, I know a lot of people who have very strong floating ribs, but don't use them at all. So uh, right now, uh, right now I'm kind of breathing a little bit higher in my chest. And so you can kind of hear that in my voice. If I'm breathing into my belly and speaking from my belly, you can hear that in my voice. It tends to lower a little bit. If I'm speaking from my floating ribs, let's just move the microphone away. When I'm speaking from my floating ribs, there's a lot more power to my voice because I'm using that muscle set to support the voice. And I think of speaking from that muscle set. And so there's a lot more strength in my voice. It's not appropriate for a headset microphone because it's so loud, but it's very appropriate if I want to sound a little bit more confident, even, even if I'm not, you know, uh, you don't have to throw your voice. I have a very optimized voice with this kind of thing. So it's very loud for me, but you don't, you don't have to be super loud with your floating ribs. They can just add a a cleanness to the voice, a clarity and a stability to the voice, they can also allow you to project further. And, and I will send you all a link. I don't have the link at this moment, but I will put it on the replay. Um, and I will, with the follow-up email, I'll send it to you as well. Does that answer your question, Dia? It does, but can I sneak in one? Yes, absolutely. Very Great quest. No one else wants to speak. Ask, ask away. <laughs> How do you regulate or how do you uh, determine if your volume is excessive when you're wearing the uh, earpieces or <clears throat> headphones, you know, um, the uh, mm. iPod, what are those uh, AirPod things, whatever they're called for yeah. you? I find when I have those in or if I have, you know, headset like you, I'm yeah. not sure, am I shouting or am I talking too softly? What, what tips do you have for that? Ooh, I've never thought of that before. That's a really good question. And as we, as we interact more with technology, this is going to come up more and more. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll tell you the way I do it, and then maybe an answer will come from that. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's very important to be aware of where your microphone is. That's the first thing. So I know that my microphone is right next to my mouth, so I'm just speaking conversationally. Now, my conversational voice, I am very aware of how loud my conversational voice needs to be because in conversation, when I'm talking to someone, I am reading their gestures and their body language and their facial expressions and constantly aware of their reactions to my voice and whether or not they feel like they need to lean in, whether they're leaning back because I'm too loud. So I have calibrated in conversation to what my conversational volume should be and that, so that's kind of the first thing is one one needs the feedback of a, a live audience in the right place <laughs> to kind of decide what your conversational tone should be um and then if if the microphone is if i'm wearing a lapel microphone or a headset microphone my voice is always energized but conversational and so i can tell um and this will happen in for example the video journal when i was Oh, that Wendy was talking about. If I'm this, this will happen occasionally in conversations. If I'm feeling quite small, and my voice collapses. Now you can actually hear me on the microphone, but it's not ideal. And this is a non-energized voice. I am, and I can feel my entire body feels collapsed. I know that I'm not speaking um, in an energetic way. So if my posture is open, and my instrument is open and I can feel that I'm using it, then I just stick to conversational 
uh, and I know that it's fine because I'm, I'm not feeling collapsed. I'm feeling open. So it's part of it is the feedback that your body is giving you, you know, um, am I accessing, you know, my breath in my belly and not my floating ribs, but, you know, lower down uh, or am I, or am I breathing up in my chest as am I collapsed? Am I open? So if I feel energized, then I stick to conversational and I know from experience from calibrating that that works and that's fine. Now, with microphones and things, the cool thing is, is that if you are too loud, people can turn you down. You know, they have, they're, they are in control of their own volume. So when we're on a call, I would always prefer to err on too loud on the, than too soft, because if I'm too soft and they have to turn their volume all the way up, as soon as someone else speaks, they're going <laughs> to they're going to have their eardrums blown out, right? Whereas if I'm a little louder than the next person who speaks and they have to turn up their volume a little bit for the next person, that's okay. Like it's, I'm not going to hurt their ears. And so I would prefer to err on the side of a little bit more energized, a little bit louder, still conversational, as close to conversational as I could be. But if I was talking to a friend who wasn't like right here, they're, um, they're kind of opposite me on a, on a slightly larger table. And that is another part of actually that that is a huge key when you're speaking to a camera you're not speaking to a camera you are speaking to a person who's on the other side of the camera and it's extremely important to remember and kind of picture that person i mean i know i can see i can see your pictures but even if i couldn't see your pictures even though i can see your pictures i'm going to put you in my mind i'm going to put you across the table from me and so when I'm speaking, even though I see your pictures here, I'm not talking to your pictures. I'm not talking to the photo of you on my computer. I am sitting on one side of the table. On the other side of my desk, I imagine there's a person behind my computer that I'm talking to. And I can't see them right now, but they're in my mind's eye. You, whoever I'm speaking to in this moment, is on the other side of my computer. And I can feel that space. Remember, humans are very spatial in the way that we think and our bodies respond to space so strongly. And so if I'm talking to a camera, my body's gonna respond to that by being like, well, what's the point? There's no one there. I feel like I'm talking to a machine, what's going on? Whereas if I have a strong sense, a physical sense of someone else sitting opposite me and I'm using your pictures to kind of create that composite image of that person sitting opposite me, if I have a strong physical sense of that, if my imagination is strong in that, my body will respond appropriately. And so I always do imagine, it's not really conscious anymore, but I always do imagine that there is a person sitting opposite me that I am speaking to through the computer because your body will respond to that too. Um, did that answer your, I, it was, I went on a weird tangent there, but did that help? <laughs> Fantastic. Fabulous. You never know what you're gonna get at open house. <laughs> Beautifully, uh, uh, you, you have a wonderful way of uh, communicating, uh, Danielle. Very, uh -huh. very, you know, they say clarity is velocity. <laughs> well, I feel like it was very haphazard, so I'm glad that some clarity came across. <laughs> this is the danger of speaking extemporaneously, that you don't always know where your thoughts are going to take you. Like, if you, if you know what you think about something, you can organize your thoughts beforehand and then speak. But if you don't know what you're going to say because you don't know what you think yet, uh, then you just got to make it up as you go. Amazing. So um, I have some more questions here. Fantastic. Amazing. Um, question. Should we stand? Oh, we said that already. Um, when we are giving a speech or talk, how often would we pause? <gasps> and how long should the pause be? Let me pause before I answer that question. That's such a good question. I love this question. And the answer, again, <laughs> all of my answers are like, there's no definitive rule. And the reason is because everything that I do, I, I try not to work from the surface down. I try to work from the inside out. And so when we, when we inundate, inundate people with rules, when we just give you like this rule and that rule and this rule and that rule, we just get overwhelmed and then we can't speak and we, we become so stiff and the more we're trying to hold in our brains, 
the more difficult it is to be relaxed and confident speakers. And so I don't like giving speakers rules. I like letting speakers understand the, the reason behind the rules. And then, then once you understand it, you can live it and you don't have to, it doesn't have to occupy that space. You don't have to be thinking about it when you're speaking. So the answer is um, there is no definitive kind of length for a pause. Um, it's not like you want to be counting in your head. I'm going to pause one, two, and then I will speak again. You know, we don't want to do that. Um, a pause, the more important thing about a pause is that it needs to be full of life. If a pause is empty, even if it's very short, it's too long. With a pause is full of life, it can be really long. I have experienced amazing long pauses in my life. And there are long pauses. I mean, we use this in the entertainment industry and in storytelling. You know, there's a there's a famous opening scene. It was a terrible movie, but a wonderful opening scene. Uh, Clive Owen eating a carrot. And he's just sitting there eating a carrot. It's the opening scene of the movie. And it's there's no dialogue. Nothing's happening. He's just sitting there eating a carrot. But it's so engaging because he's so in it. You know, so it's about being alive in your pause. And one of the ways that we stay alive in a pause is to continue to breathe. If we hold our breath when we're pausing, so if I'm speaking and then I need to pause for a second because I need to think, and I hold my breath, oh, I feel so uncomfortable. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if you felt uncomfortable, but I felt awful. Uh, so instead, we allow the pause to live and be alive by breathing. So if I need to think, if I'm pausing to think specifically, and I don't know what to say next, I will just let myself breathe while I'm thinking. And it allows my audience to relax while I'm pausing because I'm breathing, which means they're breathing because of the mirror neurons. And that allows them to relax and the pause is full of life. Now, it's not just about breathing. It's also about being full in your body and in your intent. So <clears throat> you need to be alive in your body when you're speaking. That should always be true. And in your connection with your audience. So some people, when they pause, they disconnect. And that is also death. So if I pause and then I come back, I've lost you. But it, if, if I'm with you and I pause because we're, we're having this moment together, it's fine, right? And it, it can be quite long. The, the, the key is to be alive and to stay connected. Always pause more than you think you need to. So that's the other thing is that people are like, okay, well, you know, as long as it's alive, but if, I, if I'm not sure if it's alive or not, then maybe I just won't pause. That is a bad idea because we need to breathe and breathing takes time. And also our audience needs to hear us and they need to process what we're saying. And so pauses can be a real gift to our audience to, at the end of anything important, at the end of any sort of tidbit of knowledge, to let our audience absorb that before we move on. That is an extremely important thing to do. Uh, so yeah, so if I've, so I've just dropped a bombshell, it's important to pause, let them process, let them laugh, let them think, let them go, oh, that totally did happen to me. Allow them to have their experience before you move on because we really rob our audience of the content, of the juicy content of our talk, of, of you know, really getting to absorb what we're saying if we're going at the speed of light because they're struggling to catch up with us. And even if they can hear everything we're saying, if we're not speaking so fast that it's hard to follow, but we're speaking without pauses, it means that there are no rest stops. There's no time to process. And they're having to spend all of their energy just keeping up with you. And they're not getting to integrate what you're saying. And so my short answer, that was the long answer. The short answer is pause as often as you can in a way that feels natural. Never choreograph a pause unless you're doing a TED talk or like something very specific that is very performative. I would never choreograph a pause, but pause as often as you can that feels natural. If you feel like you need a pause, you definitely need to pause. You should never get to the point where you feel like, man, this has run away with me. I need a pause because your audience will need it before you do. And so pause as often as you can, allow yourself to relax into it. And the pause can be as long as it needs to be as long as it's alive. Well, let's see if I've actually answered that question because I feel like I went on a bit of a tangent. How often should we pause and help? Yeah. So pause as often as you can 
in a way that feels natural and they can be as long as they need to be as long as they're alive oh i give the most terrible dependent answers don't i i just i won't i won't i won't clearly there are no yes or no answers with me there must be sometimes uh love the topic of changing paradigms that no longer serve us yes 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 amazing uh, 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 do we have any other questions any other questions folks any other speakers anyone else feeling like they might want to be interviewed or something technical questions are very welcome yes do you Can want to I speak up yeah yes, just speak please. it just I'm just speaking. curious. I, um, I would really love to be able to save the chat and it's not enabled. Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I copied down my what people said about me, but there's some other things in here that are really cool. So I don't know if that's something, you know, off the top, Danielle, or that maybe the next time is in my Zoom settings. And I can't remember why I turned it off. I know mm -hmm. there was a reason. Oh, I know the reason. Mm. Um. I turned it off and I'm going to actually keep it turned off, but I, I'll send you the, the everyone oh, chat. Yay. I can send you the everyone chat. The reason okay. I turned it off is because I don't know if this is fixed, but Zoom had a glitch for a while mm -hmm. that when you saved the chat, it included private messages between people. Oh. And I thought that was uncool. Yeah. That's probably fixed by now because that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to, I want to err on the side of caution. So I will mm -hmm. download, I get the chat, I'll download the chat. And I, I'll, I can send it in the follow-up email. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. It's like, I know there's a reason for that, um, <laughs> but I need to look into that because it's probably not true anymore. That was years, that was before COVID. So Zoom have made a million updates since then. So that's a good question. Any other questions? Anyone else want to speak? You can just watch me do my interpretive dance while I wait. <laughs> Oh no, your iPad's about to die. Thank you so much for coming, Danielle. It was lovely to see you. Uh, maybe next time I'll I'll interview you. Maybe next time, um, although I've interviewed you already, but not here. Um, if no one else has any questions, then I have one final question for you, and we're going to wrap it up. My final question uh, for all of you. So, kind of the way we did the introductions, but now we're going to go around and uh, and actually, Danielle, if you have time to say it in the chat, you can. Otherwise, uh, don't worry about it. I'll follow up with you later. Uh, I would love to know what your favorite part of today was. So, Danielle, Danielle, are you still here? Are you available? Is your battery? Ah, yes. Can you just tell me what your favorite part of today was? Before you, before your battery dies, you'll have to unmute yourself, though. Oh, sorry. I have three <laughs> percent, so I'm like, I may <gasps> die mid sentence. Okay. Um, I just really enjoyed hearing everyone's stories. I thought the information was wonderful. I love the way you bro broke it down. I love learning from other people's questions as well. So I really, really appreciate it. And all the helpful tips, all of it was fabulous. So your one favorite thing was everything. <laughs> it's pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> thank you so much, Danielle. I hope you're- Thank you for having me. Your nice battery you. situation improves. <laughs> <laughs> it will. It just needs to turn off for a little while. Yeah, it's just to plug it Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Wendy, you're next on my list. What was your favorite thing of today? Oh, you're on mute, love. How can something so obvious be so... <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> my favorite thing, Danielle, is your responses. The information, you may think you're not clear, but I learned so much from, from as you, pro well, as you process, as you express, as you open to whatever comes up for you, it's gold. So thank you. Aw, thanks so much. Uh, Clara, you're next on my list. What was your favorite thing about today? Um, I agree with Danielle. It's listening to everybody's stories and, and to your feedback also, obviously. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. And Dion, what was your favorite thing about today? I love the way uh, everybody is a passionate evangelist for <laughs> their particular cause. And um, your um, erudite responses, uh, you know, just uh, complemented that. It was like oxygen listening to you. <laughs> oh, I, can I put that on my business cards? It was like oxygen listening to you. That's amazing. So thank you, Dion. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right. I love how, how much passion shows up in these calls. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not gathering 
apathetic folks here. You know, anyone who wants to speak, they want to speak because they're passionate. They've got a real reason for it. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons I love uh, hosting these events because the open house, uh, it's open to the public so anyone can come. Yes, in my community, in the paid membership, uh, you guys get to share your passion and, and talk on it at practice labs and you have lots of other opportunities to speak. But for the open house, it's so great because it's open to the public. Anyone can come and speak about something that's important to them or just listen. And I will be holding another one of these uh, probably in August, maybe in July. I don't know, probably in August. My schedule is unclear for summer because I got some stuff going on, but uh, I will absolutely let everyone know about it. So if you are watching this replay and you are excited, you want to get on the next call, just message me like private message me or write in the in the comments below that you'd like to be involved in the next one and i will make sure that you hear about it uh and thank you so much for those of you who came on the call to these speakers today i really appreciate it and to all of you watching i hope you're getting a lot out of it and i will see you all next time if you're not part of the public group the uh, inspired community authentic human communication group join because there's all sorts of stuff. There's this and lots of other things happening all the time. Thank you all so much. It was lovely to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.